Alright, what is going on, lovely ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Nate Talks. Most of this, obviously, is going to be uh, E3 related. I took notes of various things, you know, some of the live streams I was able to watch, some of them I missed, so I had to catch up with, uh, just, you know, news articles and stuff like that. But I took notes, and most of what I'm actually going to say is just, like, reading directly from those notes. There are some things that I want to expand on a bit more. But, you know, it's going to be kind of quick, rapid fire. I'm not really going to stick on any one topic too long. But firstly, before I get to that, Gerard G asked me a question, which basically was, do I think Persona 4 Arena is going to be dead post-Evo? And to that, I feel like I must pose a question of my own. Doesn't it already have one foot in the grave? It's the I mean, as far as I'm aware, it is the oldest... Uh, not, not, not the oldest, but the not least recently i can't think of the words properly but the one that was updated last right like it's the oldest game right now since then you've had unil as far as i'm aware guilty gear and now blaze blue chrono phantasma extend persona 4 arena has had 2.0 sitting in the wings for like four or five months now since the arcade update no word as far as i'm aware about a console update and yet it's a main game featured at evo and that really, that gets me a little bit. Like, that really irritates me that Arc System Works didn't step up and be like, yo, one of our games is on the main stage. Let's make sure they have the current version. Let's make sure they have the best version. I don't even know if it's the best version or not. Like, didn't they? I don't know. Anyway, that's, BS, that's beside the point. The fact that Arc System Works didn't step up and make sure the Persona 4 Arena Ultimax version 2.0 was the main feature game really pisses me off and really just kind of is a perfect display of like why I've just been just snowballing downhill in my regard for them as a company because they don't care about their community outside of Japan and it just shows it perfectly even though this Evo is going to have the largest and I mean every single Evo that comes around there's a larger international presence but this is the first time that Evo itself really has a significant international presence there were obviously a few players but it was a bare handful for blaze blue last year this year you have all kinds of guilty gear players showing up and you have all kinds of persona 4 arena players showing up and they're completely disregarding them too they're disregarding their own japanese players by saying hey thanks for supporting our game in the arcades for the past five months go play an old version an old obsolete version that you haven't been keeping up to date with. They're even losing money on that too. You have to imagine because people will stop going to arcades and playing the current version so they can get back on the grind with the old version and make sure they understand they lose the muscle memory they've developed for the most recent game because some things won't work, some things will. And so it's it really I Persona 4 Arena I'm not saying it should not have been there, but that should have been a part of it. Mr. Wizard really should have said, look, I'll put Persona 4 Arena into Evo, but you have to get us the current version. You have to you have to do something for me too. Like you can't just throw you can't I won't just put the game in and have it be an old obsolete version nobody cares about anymore. You have to give us the current version. And obviously that didn't happen, and so we're playing an old version, and that really irritates me. So absolutely yes, I think Persona 4 Arena is going to be dead and forgotten the moment the tournament is over because everybody is still waiting for an announced update that's that's the anime community and they, as so long as the anime community continues to support that kind of business they're going to keep doing it and there's really there's very little one little old person me can do about that but so obviously we know i'm very opinionated on that regard but that's how that's what i think you know post evo persona 4 arena nobody's going to care about it anymore very few people care about it now uh, and that sucks, but that's just how it is. So anyway, let's go on to E3. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Bethesda. I'm not sure if this was the first one, but it was the first news stories I saw in regard to Bethesda. Very excited for Dishonored 2. That hype kind of died away a bit when they announced the Dishonored Definitive Edition. Actually, you know what? I should have done this first. Let me just go really, really quickly here. I can type quite fast, I promised. Uh... I want to see what the release date was for the original Dishonored. Because the Dishonored Definitive Edition is coming out. It's not even two years old. Oh, never mind. It is. It's two and a half years old. But still, that's a two and a half year old game. Two and a half years old. 
and it's receiving an updated version like come on man like bring me give me an hd update of morrowind or some shit if you want to do i'm so just like i'm so done with this whole last generation games that everybody can still go out and find easily at any store in the world that uh sells games and we're going to give you an hd version for it and we're going <laughs> to we're going to sell it to you for 60 bucks for full price like that blows my mind that it's still such an active part like more than 50 percent of the games of the current generation are probably hd re-releases devil may cry 4 is getting one too god damn just oh irritates the hell out of me all right so anyway the next thing they did they announced a uh, one of the online card games called elder scrolls legends which is their answer to hearthstone that irritates me uh, number one, I just wrote this down. This is like the answer to World of Warcraft all over again. Get the fuck out the bandwagon. And the thing to me this speaks of is that the moment I see somebody reference their game as this is going to be the competition for X. This is going to be the be a better version of X. I think you've already lost. I think you've already started out the gate with a failure of a game. And here is why. Because you're not approaching this from a place of creativity from a place of something that you want to do, something that you think will be a wonderful addition to games. You're looking at another game and seeing it make all the money in the world and going, I want a piece of that. And that is a terrible place to begin a creative process from. But that's what it is. And, and then, obviously, later on, EA announces their own Star Wars card game. It's the same exact fucking thing. So it's just like... That sucks whenever you see something, anything, kind of come from out of nowhere. And that's what Hearthstone did. Like, did anybody really think a game like Hearthstone would achieve the massive popularity it did? I don't think so. I don't think anybody really predicted that, but Blizzard fucking hit a gold mine right there. And now you have the people coming out, holding out their hands and saying, Can I please have a piece of that, sir? And it's not going to fucking work, but they're going to do it anyway. And I, that just that approach to game design really irritates me mass effect and we moved on to ea now mass effect andromeda y'all better not fuck it up i'm so excited please don't mass effect 3 me oh it's coming out in holiday 2016 don't not hype anymore <laughs> but then bioware showed off a knights of the old republic trailer it was actually i mean i have to admit whenever bioware does a cg trailer it looks fucking amazing. Like I can't, I I can't think of any trailers Bioware has done that have not been just like, oh, please make like a full like featured full massive movie like two hours long just out of this premise, please, and I will pay for it and I will watch it. And that's what it was. It was a fantastic trailer. And then, oh, this is an update to the Old Republic. It's not a new game. Fuck. So egg. Like this. That's kind of the entire thing. Like this e3 for me was like getting my hopes up and then getting them smashed down into the ground and buried that was kind of that was kind of the theme so anyway uh let's see afro samurai 2 is gonna have a new game which i'm kind of excited for unfortunately i'm probably more excited for the soundtrack than i am for the actual game <laughs> because that's how it was like i really enjoyed the first afro samurai game it was it was a very good action game but i certainly got more enjoyment out of the soundtrack for that game than i did out of the game itself so i'm excited to see how that goes Mirror's Edge Catalyst, another game that I'm very excited for. However, they what they showed off was very kind of like a mixture of action and platforming versus having a heavy emphasis on platforming with occasional combat. And so I really hope they aren't upping the combat factor too much where it kind of takes away from the overall platforming of the entire game. Uh, but I still, that's another game I'm very, very excited for. That's all of EA that I gave a shit about. Ubisoft from honor boy I sure like this generic medieval battle scene it's super impressive and then when they come out I don't know why companies are still doing this like it's been proven numerous times over and over that like when companies show a live demonstration most of the time it's not live it's pre-recorded because they don't want anything to go horribly fucking wrong it's going to ruin the show but so anyway they're showing this trailer they're following one dude the entire time and so I'm just thinking boy how convenient is it that the main guy they're focusing on never even gets close to dying? And he gets the finishing blow, the winning blow. That's great coincidence right there. 
So then the Ubisoft stuff goes on, and then I'm just sitting there thinking the entire time, damn, Tom Clancy must be making all of the monies. That was basically every like everything they announced. They announced a new South Park uh, RPG. They announced that From Honor game, and then there were like four Tom Clancy games. <laughs> Rainbow Six, Ghost Recon, uh, The Division, and okay, maybe three. There might have been a fourth that I might be forgetting. But anyway, I'm actually quite excited. Ghost Recon looked really slick. And I am kind of looking forward to that one. The other ones, yeah, not so much. But Ghost Recon looked very cool. So that's Ubisoft. Sony. This isn't necessarily a commentary on Sony. It's more of a commentary on Square Enix. But since Square Enix was featured in the actual Sony uh, live main stage event, we're going to comment on Square Enix first. I love how they didn't even show Final Fantasy XV at all. Like, I think that's just a perfect commentary of kind of where most people are at right now with that. But then they show off this World of Final Fantasy game. And I'm sitting there like, what the... I, what even is this? This is just not hype at all. And so, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not a huge Final Fantasy fan. I didn't grow up on Final Fantasy. I'm, it's kind of the same thing with Nintendo. I don't have that nostalgia factor driving me further forward in the series. So, maybe, you know, I'm sitting there like, maybe Final Fantasy fans are excited for this. And they pan over the crowd, and there's, like, two people, like, politely golf clapping. And nothing else. There's no cheering, nothing. There's just some a little bit of polite clapping, but nothing further. And so then that just really amused me, because Final Fantasy XV is very... Everybody's very wary of it after the whole Final Fantasy XIII thing. Then this World of Final Fantasy thing happens, and everybody's just like, God, what are they doing? Square Enix, please. And then, boom. Final Fantasy VII Remake announcement. The fucking entire arena erupted. People around the world probably started furiously masturbating to it. Pers again, personally, uh, I've never actually been able to get into Final Fantasy VII myself. I do own it on PSN. I think the furthest I've gotten into it is maybe like three, four hours at the max. It's just never been something that's really resonated with me the way it resonated with so many other people. And so I wasn't particularly excited for it. But then later on down the road, uh, somebody interviewed Square Enix, the main producer of the Final Fantasy VII remake, whoever the person's name is. And he basically said, why would I revisit a game and not change things? So basically saying, like, it's not going to be a 100, it's not going to be a reproduction it's going to be a reimagining, kind of, sort of, like that kind of thing. Like, there's anything is open to change, and I'm sitting there like, ooh, that could go poorly. <laughs> like, could you imagine the things that they could change that could just absolutely ruin everything and cause like riots? That now this game isn't actually Final Fantasy VII and they ruined it all and blah blah blah. Like, ooh, that could go poorly. So I'm kind of. I have, I'm a mixture of, like, scared and excited. Scared because it would really suck to see a game that is regarded as such a, as much of a classic as that is to be ruined. But also excited because it's not really a classic for me. So, like, just being on the outside looking in, it's kind of that whole, you know, sadism kind of... <laughs> suffer. You kind of, you know, it's just... it's part of people you kind of enjoy you know it's the same exact thing you, you know you drive by a car wreck or something you got that morbid fascination with the whole thing and that's kind of what it is you're walking you're just kind of there's a car wreck that's a bummer for them glad it didn't happen to me but that looks kind of cool and so uh yeah but anyway yeah that could that could that could go poorly but then the big one that outstaged that upstaged whatever the hell just kind of made everybody forget about Final Fantasy 7 for a second. Shinmu 3. Let me actually go check that shit out. I bookmarked the page just so I could periodically look in and see how the Kickstarter's going. So basically, it got funded in less than 10 hours. The announcement was made sometime around 6.30 um, p.m. for me, Pacific Time. And then I woke up sometime around 4 a.m. Pacific Time. That's less, that's, you know, less than 10 hours later. It was fully funded by then. It had, barely, it was at, like, a few, like, $20,000 over two, the $2 million goal. 12 hours later, because I was after class, I came back, I looked at it again. It was up another $700,000, and now it's up to $3.3 million. So it's definitely tapered away quite a bit, uh, but it's still, that's $3.3 million within two days, actually, I guess it's been three days of the announcement. 
that's amazing to see. I mean, just seeing stuff like this, Mighty Number no. Nine. I know the original, like a bunch of the uh, original team members of Rare that made Banjo Kazooie. Uh, they have a Kickstarter going on. I don't know specifically what it's called, but I know that got funded, and that's really amazing. Absolutely phenomenal to see this happen. To see these games that you've wanted to see for so long, that. You're, you know, people are clamoring for them. People are wondering, you know, where's this whole genre gone? Why are, why aren't people making these kinds of games anymore? And the answer is that they can't get the board of directors to invest in shit. And so it's absolutely just phenomenal to be able to see these beloved developers come out and say, look, we can't get the funding necessary from various developers in order to get this game made. Do you want this game or not? Here's your opportunity to see it happen. And just the swarm of support for it that has come out is absolutely phenomenal. I love seeing that. And, you know, you love seeing the middleman taken away that's really, you know, is only in it for the dollar signs. To see that pulled away and just gone, fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. So I'm super excited about that. And even though, like, I don't, I personally, I have not uh, actually thrown money at Shinmu yet because I'm very wary regarding Kickstarters. Like it's just it's the same thing with early access. I'm very iffy on kind of doing that kind of stuff. But you know, if I maybe I will end up you know throwing a little bit of money at it. But if I don't, like for sure I'm gonna buy. Same thing with Mighty Number no. Nine. I didn't support that either. Um, just be, like I said, it has nothing to do with the game. Like I would love to see it made, but I am just very. <laughs> I'm paranoid, and I don't want to throw my money at something that could end up going south. And uh, but yeah, like the moment either one of those games comes out, you know I'm gonna fucking buy that and support and show support for it because I think that kind of thing deserves support. And being able to cut out, you know, the whole the non gamers that are only in it for the business angle of things, being able to say basically just you know flip the middle finger to them and cut them out of the equation is an absolutely wonderful thing. So anyway. They showed more Star Wars stuff in the Sony stuff, and I was sitting there thinking, just please, please, give me something. Give me something, Bioware, something to be excited for. And no, it was for Disney Infinity. It was the addition of Star Wars characters to Disney Infinity. Great. So let's just move on. So now we're getting into all the stuff uh, that I only saw via news articles and whatnot. A near sequel, which was very surprising because the very first game uh, that came out has a very niche following, very, you know, cult classic kind of a deal. A lot of people regard it very highly. I, myself, could never get into it. But so that's why it's very surprising to see an update of it is, you know, it didn't do too well. It wasn't very... I mean, it's not exactly a game that was on anybody's radar. But now Platinum Games is involved from the uh, gameplay side of things. And now I'm excited. Because you can usually trust Platinum Games to get their shit right. So I'm very, I'm very excited for that. And then Persona 5, way to fucking go, Atlas... They showed the same exact trailer for Persona 5 that was already shown months ago. The same exact one. Good job. Way to build up the hype. So anyway, moving on to a little bit of a mixture because I think everything else that I have left is Nintendo related. Yes, it is Nintendo related. So firstly, just my general note overall of the entire reaction to all of Nintendo stuff. Nintendo fans seem mad. And they do. Oh, they do. For a variety of reasons. And I'll freely admit, I'm a little bit in there with them. But not for the same reasons. I'm in there because of uh, Fire Emblem. So, firstly, before we get... There's a Wii U version, obviously. The uh, Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem was announced at the ver last year's Evo. It's kind of a big thing for the Wii U. And I was very excited about that. And I was looking forward to it. And obviously, I made assumptions about how that stuff would go. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to talk about the 3DS Fire Emblem first. Apparently, that's getting two versions. Like, it's going Pokemon. There's two different games for the same game. Like, why? I might not buy it just out of principle now. Like, I love Fire Emblem. I really do. But you're going to nickel and dime your fan base? What? I mean, with Pokemon, it's kind of, you know, it's tradition now. It's not really that big of a deal, but to basically sell two different games, which really aren't too... Like, Mega Man Battle Network tried it numerous times, and it actually kind of 
led to that series going away because they did a few. I think it started with three because they had blue and white. Was four, I can't remember if four or five was the tactical one. I think five was the tactical one, but anyway, they were selling two versions, and they just they didn't sell very well after that. Mega Man Battle Network one and two I, were very successful. I believe three was very successful, and after that, it just kind of tapered away when they started trying to sell two versions. And to see this series, which basically hasn't really come outside of Japan very often for because it hasn't been selling well, making a decision like this, which is going to harm its sales. You, there's really no other way around it. If it comes out with two versions, there are going to be a bunch of people, similar to me, who are going to be kind of like, eh, I really can't support that. I, I'm not going to support this business decision. And the only way you can do that is to not buy the game. It's unfortunate because I'm going to miss that experience. I love Fire Emblem. But when it comes to basically saying, I either have to indulge my love of this game at the cost of supporting business mechanics that I do not agree with, I'm not going to do it. I am going to use my money and say, no, this deserves to be going somewhere else. Regardless of what, you know, how easily I could afford it or whether or not I'm, you know, budgeting to be able to purchase this game, I will not buy it. I could be a millionaire and I still would not spend my money on it because I don't agree with the business practice. So that really fucking sucks for me. Like already I'm sitting here and I'm excited about a new Fire Emblem and now that happens and it's not, as far as I'm aware, it's not confirmed. Like, it is confirmed there's two versions inside of Japan. But so far, there's no worldwide confirmation. So we'll see how that goes. But again, like, if that is how it goes, looks like Nate's going to miss the first Fire Emblem since the uh, Game Boy Advance versions, which is, that's a bummer. But then, again, the uh, SM, the Shimagami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem stuff, which has been renamed to Gne Ube Roku. However the hell you pronounce that. And I know it's not a hashtag FE, but I'm going to call it hashtag FE just because it looks stupid and I want it to go away. Gane Uben Roku, hashtag FE. <laughs> so, uh, it's it, they showed off a little bit of gameplay. Uh, originally, they only showed another trailer. And so, the big thing about it is it's very idol culture based, the story of it. Which is really disappointing given the fact that I recently played a game called Omega Quintet, which was a an idea factory game based around the same thing it was it was basically a satire of the uh idol culture that is prominent in japan and i did i couldn't get into it i could I, I could understand that like this game has some very strong rpg uh gameplay mechanics behind it and i would probably enjoy that but when you're looking at a potential you know like 30 40 50 however many hour experience to have that entire experience without having any investment whatsoever in the story because there's no relation to it i i don't know a goddamn thing about this idol culture shit i don't want to be a part of it i don't care about it thus i can already tell you i'm not going to give a fuck about the story so to have that be the main primary story element to it is really dissuading from the get-go but then because of what it is because it was a shin megami tensei cross fire emblem and that's how it was titled originally which obviously they've changed that title now I was really looking forward to a more tactical game. It didn't necessarily have to be, you know, exactly Fire Emblem or exactly uh, Devil Survivor. But I was hoping for there to be at least some kind of tactical, you know, strategy RPG elements within it. But it's not. It's a very traditional JRPG experience. There is some, like, I know they have uh, the whole weapon triangle thing, Lance versus... Uh, Lance versus sword versus axe. So sword beats axe, axe beats lance, lance beats sword. Um, I know they've implemented that, but mostly it's really just a traditional JRPG. And I'll be honest, it's it went from something that was like this could totally sell a console to me, because I'm still you know I'm still waiting on Bayonetta two. Obviously, Nintendo always has very strong first party games that are fun to experience, but there's still nothing there yet. That's like this is the game that really is going to make you desire this system that hasn't happened yet and now that i've seen that now that i just know like honestly i really could just go back and play omega quintet and have more or less the same experience that i would probably have with shin megami tensei cross fire emblem i'm sorry gane aibun roku however I'm, I'm not japanese i can't pronounce that um but yeah so and then so later on i'm already sitting there thinking like this is already something that I've kind of experienced and decided wasn't for me. That's a bummer. And then there was a, a news story that basically said 
Originally, well, actually, let me just, I actually quoted it specifically. Initially, the companies began building a turn-based strategy game in the style of previous Fire Emblems. But as pre-production wrapped up and concepts were starting to take shape, both developers realized it was the wrong approach for their collaborative project. And then a quote specifically from the, uh, like the main producer of the game. If you do something like this, it's something that Fire Emblem developer Intelligent Systems could just do on their own with the main series. Do something we can't do. That's when we decided to make it a JRPG set in modern Japan. So that means originally it was everything I wanted, and now it's everything I don't. And that's infuriating. That makes me sad. So yeah, so I mean, man, the Wii U is just... The Wii U might pass me by, to be perfectly honest, as if it keeps going as it is now. Because there was nothing from the Nintendo end that was like, yo, dude, you gotta buy this now. There's, you know, there's this amazing, you know, best Zelda ever. There's this fucking huge uh, uh, addition to the Mario franchise, similar to what Mario Galaxy did for it. That kind of thing, like none of that. Nothing even close to any of that. So, yeah. But then... So, like, that's what that's what's on my end. That's what I'm angry about. Not very many people have the same opinion of it. Let's talk about something that everybody mad about. Metroid Prime Federation Force. Let me actually go check this shit out. So, when I first originally saw it and heard about it and uh, went and looked at it, the official Nintendo... Like, on Nintendo's official channel, the official trailer, Why Are You Moving So Slow? The official trailer for it had received around 400,000 views, something like that. Uh, <laughs> 4,000 likes-ish. 40,000 dislikes. So now it's up to 726,000 views. 5,800 likes, 56,000 dislikes. Apparently there's also a fucking petition to stop the game from being made, which that's... A little overboard like that what is that petition gonna do you think that's gonna work it's not gonna fucking work but still that's 10 percent likes 90 percent dislikes even a bit more skewed than that there's a little bit more a few more like 12 percent 88 percent but uh yeah the uh, the reaction to that announcement not hugely positive and then you look at the rest of it and it's just like everybody's just kind of sitting there like what the fuck nintendo <laughs> You didn't do anything. There's nothing for us. What the hell, man? Because everybody was kind of looking forward to, you know, the Wii U Zelda, the big Zelda experience that was going to come out. And, um, because I think right now the only Zelda that's available is that, like, Dynasty Warriors-ish mashup, right? I think that's the only available Zelda for Wii U. And they came out with a, a Zelda game for the 3DS, but it's one of those, like, shit, I don't even know what it's called. But it's not really a traditional Zelda it's kind of like a four-player cooperative kind of a deal. So, uh, yeah, Nintendo fans are not happy right now. And I hope that Nintendo realizes, like, maybe we, maybe we should mix some stuff up and do some other things. Because, you know, like, to not have any kind of a new Metroid game announced and then to announce this, like, spinoff that looks like a terrible PlayStation 1 game. Um, you know, no new Mario, really. You have that Yoshi's Yarn kind of a deal that was kind of... It, I, didn't pay much attention to it i just saw very brief little bits of it super mario maker obviously is that's a cool that's a very cool thing a very uh but unfortunately little big planet did it first but still it's gonna be the same thing like there's gonna be so many just completely nonsensical stupid levels designed and like one percent of them will actually be worth playing that's the unfortunate side of you know making a game like that but yeah nintendo fans are definitely uh they're left uh, treading water on their own while Nintendo sails away on their yacht and just says, Bye! Whenever you make it back to shore, we might have something worth playing for you guys. <laughs> so yeah, that was kind of hurt for Nintendo. Uh, you may have noticed that I didn't really talk about Microsoft that much. That's because Microsoft did. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. None of the companies really had anything that made me sit up and say, Oh my god, I can't believe that's coming that is a and then as that is an absolute must buy for me nobody really had anything that was particularly terribly impressive there were some games obviously they're interesting you know mass effect any mass effect game any bioware game i'm going to try out just on principle but unfortunately their last few the mass effect 3 ending fiasco the fact that dragon age inquisition was an uninspired boring 
dull piece of shit. Uh, Dragon Age 2 already was also, it's not regarded very well. Uh, Bioware's been kind of tapering away from my whole, like, it used to be, you know, if Bioware made a game, I'm getting that shit. Now it's kind of like, if Bioware makes a game, I'm going to pay close attention to it because I don't know if I'm going to buy it this time. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that really kind of a boring E3 overall. Oh, you know what? I didn't even talk about Street Fighter Five. That was the main thing. So Street Fighter Five, that's the one that I've seen the most of. That's the one that was shown off the most because uh, Capcom Fighters on Twitch basically was dedicated. Whenever E3 was live, Capcom Fighters had a stream for Street Fighter Five going. They had numerous tournaments going, and I have to admit, Street Fighter Five looks a little dull. Like. Because when, when they're originally showing everything off, they're basically showing everybody with their uh, V-Trigger. Not V-Trigger. Is V-Trigger what it's called? I think V-Trigger is what it's called. So, you know, like their powered up mode. And kind of like everything is based around that they've shown so far. So you're seeing all these crazy things, juggles, you know, really ridiculous looking moves. And all of it was based around V-Triggers. And it kind of, it just, it feels like there's not much depth like they left all of the depth in V Trigger and kind of very greatly simplified the rest of the game. And so I don't it, it just I don't know. It looks a little dull right now. I mean it it's running a lot smoother. They've clearly gotten that part down. It used to look a lot clunkier than it does now. Um uh let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Oh, uh one main thing I want to talk about. Did Cammy did Cammy do some porn tryouts? Cause her boobs look a lot bigger than they used to. Like they used to be kind of like, you know, she was she's a little, you know, musculature got some musculature going on. She a fit girl. And she was proportional to that. And now it's just kind of like there's boom. Like they they grew. They doubled in size. They didn't they done got a lot bigger. And I know there's a whole uh, apparently Chun Li's boob physics are actually bugged. When somebody picks her on the second player side, they jiggle a lot more than they're supposed to, which is an absolutely phenomenal bug. I'm assuming uh, Capcom hired somebody from Dead or Alive and they snuck that in there. Anyway, but yeah, so it's... I don't know, man. It's right now... Obviously, there's still a long way to go. There's almost an entire year before that is going to get released uh, for public consumption. But right now, I feel like it would be better for them to find a happy middle ground between base character and v-trigger character to have the game focused on rather than how it is now where it's kind of like everybody seems really limited uh and there's not really much excitement but then v-trigger happens and now options open up and now it gets exciting and there's a lot of different uh pretty hype things that can happen i think they it would be good if they found a happy middle ground like they kind of buffed up the default mode a little bit first but that's kind of my whole thought about um I, I did take a bunch of other notes, but it's kind of all, you know, stuff that, just mechanical stuff that anybody could find out. Stuff like, let me just, uh, let me see. Throw range looks super small. Chip deaths are gone. Normals do small amounts of chips similar to Mortal Kombat. Now, that it's all, you know, little notes like that kind of stuff. So, anyway, this has gone on for long enough. I have spoken for long enough. Thank you for listening. As always, if you have any questions for me that you want me to talk about specifically, I will happily field them and talk about them. And that about wraps it up. So thank you for tuning in and I will see you guys next week.